I especially appreciate the music this morning, and there's a reason I appreciate it. When I was a young man, I played the trumpet. And all through high school, I played the trumpet. I often wondered if there would ever be a time when I would be allowed to play my trumpet within the church. As a young person, I never was, until as an adult, and we were attending the Edgewood congregation, which was in Independence out on Allen Road. It doesn't even exist anymore. But we were attending there, and I believe it was during one of the Christmas seasons, we put together a brass ensemble. And then as an adult, I was able to give that ministry that I had waited so long to give, to play my trumpet. And not just to play my trumpet for myself, but for the branch, but to give my ministry to the Lord. And so that's what our sisters did this morning. They gave their ministry to the Lord in that instrumental, and I certainly appreciate that so much. I need to get my notes. I'm going to read for you this morning a scripture that's found in 1 Chronicles. It's in chapter 29, beginning with verse 9. And it reads, And then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom. O Lord, thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honors come of thee. And thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thee, thy glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own we are given to thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. O Lord, our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house, and thy holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these, and now I see with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto them. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto me and give unto Solomon, my son, perfect heart and keep thy commandments, thy testimonies and thy statutes and do all these things to build the palace for that which I have made provision. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word that it would take place within us and into our understanding. My wife and I have been attending here for a couple of years now, and still I'm getting to know many of you for the first time, and what a blessing that is. We're so glad that we were able to come to this branch and to share with those of our family, those of like like faith, uh, we came from the Saints branch with Jeff and Beth are back, back there and a few others. And uh, people say, well, why did you leave that branch? I said, well, actually, we retired that branch. 
there were very few of us left and we were getting a little older and we were spending quite a bit on rent and that didn't seem to be appropriate that our money could go to a branch, other branches, and be more beneficial in, in help building the kingdom in Zion. And so we retired the Saints branch. Uh, some of us are tendering here, some of Oak Grove. I know there's a couple in Wellington and so forth. But we we're so happy to be here. And my wife would be here this morning. And she had a procedure Thursday where, and I don't think I'm violating the HEPA rules or anything here in telling you, she had one of her toes shortened. She had a tumor on the end of her big toe. And so she's laying up this morning. I know she's probably sitting in her recliner chair. She's probably watching me on that thing. And so I would say, hi, honey. That's probably never been said from the pulpit before. But I am glad to be here and, and to share with you this morning and, and so forth. Uh, when I was a young person, my aunt had a father, and his last name was Bullard, and I guess she wasn't part of, my mother's name was Benner, and my name was Clement, and she was not either of either those. I guess she would be an aunt-in-law. But her father's name was uh, Grandpa Bullard to all of us. And every morning, Grandpa would get up, and I, I can testify this because I've heard him say it, and he would just look and he around, and regardless of the weather, regardless of what was going on that day, he would say, what a wonderful day. The Lord hath wrought. I don't think I'd ever heard that word wrought before. But it means what a wonderful day the Lord hath made. And I know you've heard maybe of wrought iron, things that are forged. And so the day was made good by the Lord and it was forged by the Lord. From the very beginning, each and every day that we live, he knew of and he created and he forged for us. And I believe that this morning, as we gather together, that we have two reasons, maybe more, but two reasons specifically for being here. One is to keep the commandments. We are commanded to keep the Sabbath day holy. In Genesis 2, 1 through 3, it said, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and I, God, in joy, ended my work, and all things which I had made I rested on the seventh day from all my work and all the things which I had made were finished. And I, God, saw that they were good and I, God, blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it I had rested from all my works which I, God, had created and made. So from the very beginning, this is in the second chapter of Genesis, this day that, you, that we are here in this fellowship, was blessed and sanctified. And of course, we know that in Exodus, that it's the fourth great commandment, is to keep it holy and to rest on this day. And so we are here by commandment. There's another reason we may be here this morning, and that is because we choose to be here. We choose to honor this, this commandment. We choose to bring our worship this morning to his house. We choose to keep the commandments. And we choose to exercise our stewardship by even being here this morning. Two great reasons for being here. And I'd like to focus this morning on stewardship. You go, oh, there's that word, stewardship. He's going to be talking about my money. Well, maybe, maybe a little bit but not totally, because stewardship is defined as our whole soul response to the goodness of God and our desire to live by his every word. Stewardship is our active response to his gospel, to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our active response. Stewardship is one of the great words of the Christian experience. We do ourselves a major injustice when we seek to understand stewardship or to present it, except that it is made luminous in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great teacher and example 
and vindicator of stewardship as a way of life. On the other hand, whenever we do look at stewardship as the Lord Jesus saw it and lived it and taught it, it takes off a grandeur which it can never otherwise attain. Stewardship is more than a means of handling one's finances, more than payment for our earthly blessings, more than a temporal means to a spiritual end. Stewardship is life itself, recognized as the gift of God and offered back to him in the spirit in which it was given us. It is life lived after the pattern of the Son of God. These words that I have just shared with you are not specifically my own, although I believe them, I share them, I believe they're true, but they're the words of F. Henry Edwards, as uh, he in his book wrote in Thy Tender Mercies, a section on stewardship. I understand the magnitude of the word stewardship, that it, if we choose, that we are engaged in the act of stewardship each and every day of our life and in every endeavor that we have. This is when I served in the office of deacon, my ministry was to the temporal needs of the branch. And while a deacon, I, I, I served as the head deacon. When I served as a priest, my service was to the temporal needs of the branch. And in that office, I was the bishop's agent of the Edgewood branch. And as an elder, my ministry is to the spiritual needs of the branch. And in two of our branches, I served as pastor. So I understand that in each case, that calling and that ministry that is specific to that individual is their stewardship and their active response to their call and their active response to Christ in their life. Stewardship is our full response to the talents and gifts that God places within each one of us. Stewardship is our full response. Hopefully this morning we are here for both reasons that I mentioned, to keep his commandments and that we choose to be here and to magnify him even by our presence. In the opening scripture I read in 1 Chronicles, there was one word that is repeated several times. And the word was heart. I don't know if you picked up on that. It was heart. And there was an adjective that was used before the word heart. And that was to have a perfect heart. To have a perfect heart is our stewardship. The perfect heart. And I would like to read this. It says that the people rejoiced, for they willingly, because with perfect heart, they offered willingly to the Lord. Jesus requires a perfect heart to be the righteous people that he requires to bring forth his kingdom and to be the citizens within that kingdom. And we talked a little bit this morning, this morning with a heart was mentioned that perhaps it was just not required that we have a perfect heart, but we have a willing heart and a good heart and so forth, and that we do our very best. And certainly that is the case. He requires the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. In Third Nephi 4 and 49, And you shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood, Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, for I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings, and you shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This becomes our stewardship to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our whole soul response to the goodness of God and our desire to live by his every word. In Genesis 7 and 23, we find the record of a righteous people. 
making the required sacrifice. And they were called Zion because they were of one heart and one mind. They were of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So this is nothing new in the scriptures, that this is what's required of us. In the beginning in Genesis, a whole people were of one heart and one mind. And they were the heart of Jesus, and they were the mind of Jesus. So, how is our heart made perfect? And how do we have a broken heart to offer to the Lord? We become one with him. That's what he calls us to do. That's what he longs for us to do. He wants us to become one with him. Body, mind, and soul. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. A few weeks ago, uh, Brother Rich, as he stood uh, in this pulpit, and he talked about the mercy seat of God, which sits atop of the Ark of the Covenant. And he said that within each one of us, there is a mercy seat. And then he asked a question, who occupies that mercy seat? He said, a lot of our cases, maybe me, maybe you, we try to occupy that mercy seat, that place that is reserved for Jesus Christ. How do we vacate that mercy seat and give it over to the Lord? We have to surrender it. We surrender, surrender our will to the will of God, and he takes place in that mercy seat to be our guide, to be our savior, to give us all the love that he has. We surrender it to him. That's not easy. We're not taught to surrender. Our military is never taught to surrender. You don't go into battle thinking, okay, we'll just go over there and lay down and we'll surrender. We'll give, our, give ourselves up. I know when I was a young man, I played football at William Christman High School. And there were a lot of times when we were behind when it came halftime. And I don't remember ever going into that locker room and the coach standing in front of us and saying, boys, boy, it's tough out there. They seem to be bigger than you. They seem to have better plays than, than we were prepared for. And so why don't we just go out there and give up? Because we're going to lose anyway. Yeah, I don't remember that ever happening. I don't care how tough the fight was, what the score was. We were told to go out there and give not only 100%, but 110%. We don't surrender. I was a firefighter for 30 years for the city of Independence. Went into a lot of situations with my brothers because they are my brothers. I lived a third of my life with them at the fire station. And when we would go to the fire scene and the flames would be coming out the top of that house, we didn't get in a little huddle over here and say, well, okay, that's a big one. Let's surrender. No. We gave 110%. We saved whatever we could save. We saved whoever we could save. And we made it mandatory that when we left that place that we left it together. We didn't surrender. We fought. So surrendering is not within our nature. But the Lord asks us to surrender to him. Give the mercy seat that's within our own minds to him. Place our faith and our trust in him. To come before him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We choose to be one with Christ when we surrender. When we surrender our natural man and become partners with him in the mission of kingdom building. Of bringing about the cause of Zion. You know, that's already happened. There's a pattern before us. In the seventh chapter of Genesis, it talks about that people that were of one heart and of one mind, and they were called Zion. So the pattern is before us. All we need to do is follow it. 
And I was thinking, you know, I have a conversation with uh, a lot of other Protestants and so forth about this being taken up into heaven. What do they call that? The rapture. And we say, oh, we don't believe in that. Well, you better believe in it because the city of Zion was taken up. They left this earth and they were in their heavenly home. They were raptured and taken up. What a good example. All we've got to decide is if we want to do the same thing. I know within Matthew, I believe it's chapter 14, it talks about the wheat being separated from the tares, the wheat being taken up, and the burning of the tares. We may not call it being raptured, but we call it having a good relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and being taken up unto him. And so we choose to be one with Christ and we surrender that, that natural man and become partners with him in this kingdom building endeavor. Of building Zion. So several years ago, and Jeff was there, maybe some of you, we had a, a three branch retreat. And on Sunday we were having a sacrament service and the priesthood was up front and each one of us was given opportunity to say a few words when it came down to me I stood and I said how many of you are tired of waiting on Zion oh I'll ask the same question here this morning how many of you are tired of waiting on Zion don't raise your hand well all their hands went up and I said if you're tired of waiting on Zion then don't don't wait on it. Live Zion and those conditions that will bring about Zion each and every day in your life. Make sure that your heart is broken and you are a contrite spirit. Because only when we live the conditions of Zion will be ready for the city of Zion to return back to us. Don't wait. The time is getting very short. Pretty soon the opportunity to thrust in our sickles and reap will be over. So this idea of having a broken heart and a contrite spirit, I was trying to explain to our brothers and sisters in Arizona. And I don't like to call them Navajo or any other word like that because that's, that puts them in a, a, a class over here and, and then we got you know, the white guy over here and the, you know all that. So they're just our brothers and sisters is what they are. And they're in Arizona. But I was trying to explain to them what it would mean to have a broken heart. Well, <laughs> they don't want to have a broken heart. That's a hardship. That's a pain. That's suffering to have a broken heart. And I thought, well, how can I explain this to them so that they would understand it? And I thought, you know, the Native Americans are supposedly great horsemen. And they use their horses on the reservation. They'll get on their horse in the morning and they'll take it out and they'll gather up their flocks of sheep and they'll take them to water. And they stay with them pretty much all day because there are dangers out there for the sheep. And so they, I thought, yeah, they know about horses and they know about breaking a horse. And so I thought I'll use that as an example because for a while I owned horses myself. And I realized my dream when we bought 10 acres out on Pink Hill Road. And I bought myself some cattle and I got myself a horse. I became a cowboy. I always wanted to be a cowboy when I was young. And I had three cows, so I was a cattle baron on 10 acres. Okay. But I had to learn how to train those horses. And so I had a mentor. George Allen was my mentor. I don't know if any of you know George Allen. Came from Idaho. He and Barb gathered in. George was a cowboy. That was his profession and a farrier. And he worked, I worked with George on, in the, the ministries in Arizona. See, I didn't use that word Navajo. So George was my mentor, and he had a round pin where I could take my horses and work with them. But to get a horse to respond, you have to break him. 
And so in the olden days, they would take and, and tie this horse up to a poor post in the middle, and they would throw a sack over his head so he couldn't see, and putting a saddle on him and so forth. And then they would yank that blind off of him and, and jump on him and ride him until he gave in, until he submitted completely, body, soul, and mind, until he gave up completely. And he had no choice but to be broke. You know, I know somebody that had that same mentality when he said, Lord, send me, and not one soul will be lost, and give me the glory. So that was the old way of breaking a horse. Well, there's a better way, a new way. And so you take the horse into this round pin, and you stand in the center of it with a, with a rope, with a lariat. And you take, and I'll do a little demonstration, you take the lariat and you just toss it out behind the horse. You don't hit him with it. You just toss it behind him. And you're asking him to move. And so a horse will. He'll move away from that rope. And he'll go around the pin until you throw the rope in front of him. And you ask him to move the other direction. And initially he will turn away from you toward the fence and move around. And this will go on and on and on until finally... You notice that you flip the rope in front of him and he turns facing you. And you do this until he's comfortable with doing that. And you'll know that the horse is ready, and this is kind of strange, when he licks his lips. And you stand in the center of the ring with your back to him and he walks up to you. At that point, that horse has decided to become one with you. You didn't break his spirit. You asked him to become one with you. So Jesus Christ stands in the middle of our round ring, and he implores us to move in various directions. And there are those that will turn their back to him and go the other way. Until they figure out that perhaps this is a good thing. This is what we need to do. They go to the center of the ring and they become partners. We go to the center of the ring and we become partners with Jesus Christ. Now I won't tell you that all horses will decide to do this because some will not. Some will decide that they're never going to be a partner with you. Isn't that like mankind? So I thought that this would be a good way to demonstrate to our brothers and sisters there that a broken heart means to submit willingly to the will of those whoever's in the middle, to Jesus Christ, and to become a partner with him. Don't know if they understood it completely. Still working on that. I think we're still working on that too. I want to share another story with you. It's a story of a young minister and his son who went to another congregation, another branch, as a, as a visiting minister. Had his little son with him. And he was sitting in the front he was sitting here in the front pew before it was his time to get up and provide the ministry. And they, they gave the offering. And when they came around to him, the dad took his billfold out and he placed a $20 bill in the collection plate. And the son looks at that and he says, wow, dad, that's a lot of money. And the dad says, yeah, I know. I believe in supporting the congregations that we go to and minister. So the young boy, he's sitting there, wow. And when the collection was taken, the pastor brought the collection plate up to him and gave him all the money. And he said, it is our practice in this branch that when we have a visiting minister to give him the collection for the, for the Sunday. And the little boy looked at his father and he says, wow, Dad, if we'd have given more, we'd have gotten more. You know, this is a fictional story. But is that not the truth? 
If we give more, we will get more. If we are better stewards and give more, we get more. Now, I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit because I'm in... I've preached before and my words have been misconstrued. I am not advocating that we pay ministers. That's not what, that's not what I'm advocating this morning. In 2 Nephi 11, 106, he says, He commands that there shall be no priestcrafts. For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light to the world that they may get gain and praise of the world. But they seek not the welfare of Zion. I haven't been, have you been paid? Yeah, we, I've not been paid. So don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating paying the ministers. But I did use that story as an example of, wow, Dad, if you'd have given more, we'd have gotten more. I had a testimony of a friend and I won't use any names in another branch. I'll use the name of the branch. But he said that when the collection was being taken up, that the minister giving the thoughts says, I want you to take your billfolds out of your purses or whatever you have. And this morning, I want you to empty them into the collection plate. Don't want you to reserve anything. Give all that you've got. And this individual that was sharing with me says, boy, I thought that was awful bold, that minister to say that. He had a little trouble with it. And he said, but still, okay, I'll empty my billfold and put it in the collection plate. And at the end of the day, the one in charge got a note. And it said, today, oh, and the reason that they were emptying it into the plate is because their oblation fund was getting a little light. And so at the end of the, the service, he got a note that says, today we have collected $1,500 for the oblation fund. And now we will have money to help those that are in need. And this individual was sharing the testimony. He says, you know, I felt about this big. The word Lord requires us to give our all. To give more that we might receive more. There's scripture found in, in Ecclesiastes. I just want to share with you very quick here. And it's found in Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 1. I always wondered about this. It says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also a portion to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the face of the earth. So I'm thinking, bread doesn't do very well in the water. And I might need that bread to eat. And yet the Lord is telling me to cast my bread upon the water and it will return unto me. So I got to thinking there's more to this than that. So what is the bread that we're casting upon the water? It's our stewardship. It's our talents. It's our abilities. It's all that we have. That bread might be life-saving to me, but I'm going to cast it upon the water. And I'm going to give it all. So what is the water? Well, the only water that I'm aware of that Jesus taught us is him. What did he tell the lady, the woman at the well, the Samaritan? He said, if you had asked, I would have given you living water. So we cast our stewardship upon Jesus Christ, and it shall return unto us. And I just about guarantee you that it will be increased when it comes back to us. Because then we were to divide it up and give a portion to seven, and we were to give a portion to eight. We know that seven is a holy number. It's the day of completion. It's the day that he rested. Seven is the day that he has commanded that we meet together on the Sabbath. And eight 
in the Bible as a symbol of renewal, of help. And so I'm thinking, you know, we give a portion to, to, to the Lord. And then we give a portion to the oblation to help those that are in need that need a new start. I may be all wrong, I don't know. But isn't that interesting? Cast your bread upon the water, and after several days it will return unto you. You give more, you get more. We give up our human nature when we provide good stewardship. And man has always been the same from the beginning of very of time. Man's nature has never changed. Every word that was given to man from the very beginning was not only beneficial to him, but it's beneficial to us because we haven't changed. And I wonder as in... In uh, 1 uh, Corinthians, as Paul was writing his letter to the Corinthians, and there were several things that he became aware of. You know, Paul wasn't in Corinth when he wrote that letter. He was in Ephesus. He was in Ephesus with John, and he was in Ephesus with Timothy. Three apostles. But he knew what was going on in Corinth. He says, because the Spirit leads me to know this. So he wrote them a letter, and there are several things that he pointed out to them. First, that there were contentions among them. Wow. Anybody know if there are any contentions today among us? So there were contentions among them. There were sins that he listed that they were engaged in. And I don't have to go over these sins because they are the same sins that we have today. All you got to do is watch the news. And you can go almost sin for sin of those things that Paul told the Corinthians to abstain from. Natural man is natural man. It's only through Jesus Christ that we became changed men and women. It's only as we cast our bread upon the water, upon Jesus Christ. It's only as we give more that we will get more. The road to the kingdom is before us. The map has been laid out. God's desire for man to sacrifice the world and return to him and accept that plan of salvation provided through his son, Jesus Christ, which was laid out also from the very beginning. It has not changed. The requirements for salvation have never changed. They are the same. We just decide if we want to be a part of it. That's all we have to do. I could go on for a little while longer if you want to know everything about our ministry in Arizona, but maybe another time. We will be heading back out there in November to minister on the reservation. And I will be taking them, hopefully, a message of hope. Because what you read in the scriptures in, about the Lamanites and the customs and traditions that separate them from the blessings of God still exist today. Our brothers and sisters need to be prayed for, that their hearts will be softened, and that they will accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and the salvation that is offered through him give up their customs and their traditions. We have maybe very few people that I consider ever being converted on the reservation. Converted by Jesus Christ. You know, he's the one that converts. We don't. We just give the message. One of them is Nancy Totacini. Her father was a medicine man on the reservation. And she would tell her, Dad, you need to give up all the ceremonies that you give. because They give those, those ceremonies because they get paid for them. Remember priestcraft? And time and time again, she told her dad that she needed to quit that and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We don't have a church on the reservation of our very own. There are, there are many, many churches there. They know Jesus Christ. They know of him. But she wanted so much to have the gospel every Sunday for her children. And there was no church. I remember sitting on her back porch with her one evening with her, her husband, husband, Lorenzo. And we're talking about the gospel. And she looks at me and she says, so what do we do now? How do you answer that question? What do we do now? Nancy wanted the gospel so much that she moved off the reservation down to a little town a little bit south, something called Snowflake, where there is a large Mormon influence, and she joined the Mormon church because that was the closest, the closest that she could get to the gospel of Jesus Christ. She knows the difference, but she wanted that for her children, and she made that sacrifice. We're going to create Zion. We've got to give more that we might receive more. Last Sunday, Marlon shared from the book of Moroni. I mean, uh, yeah. And he shared with you the last words of Moroni. You know, it was about flying away home. Remember that? If you were here last Sunday, I'll fly away home and what a great reunion that will be. Well, I'd like to share with you some words that are just a little bit previous to the very last words that Moroni spoke. And I wonder if when Moroni wrote these letters and when all the prophets write their letters or their admonitions, if they knew that in 20 and 13 they would be as poignant, as, as relevant to us as they were to the people that they were giving them to. Again, I would exhort you that you would come to Christ and lay hold upon every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the unclean thing and awake and rise from the dust, O Jerusalem, and put on your beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, and strengthen your stakes and enlarge your borders forever, that you may no more be confounded that the covenants of the eternal Father, which he has made to thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Come to Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves all ungodliness. And if you should deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then it is his grace sufficient for you that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God you are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. And again, if you by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not, and deny not his power, then are you sanctified in Christ. By the grace of God, through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father, to the remission of your sins, that you become holy without spot. I pray that the Lord will always find us in this process of bringing about that kingdom of Zion. And that he will bless each one of us in our specific talents and our specific abilities. That together as a branch, we can come together and be the body of Christ. May he bless us to this end.